Environmental assessment can be a crucial step in any development proposal to build new housing, transit, highways, or alter existing roads. When it protects sensitive ecosystems, well, it's doing its job. But some have raised concerns that it's being used to protect other interests as well. Phil Pothen is a land use planning lawyer, the Ontario Environment Program Manager at Environmental Defence, and he joins us now for more. Phil, good to have you in that chair. Thank you very much for having me. I want to start our conversation by reading something from a piece you wrote for the Toronto Star earlier this month. In order to deliver the first pro-environment majority that City Council has seen in years, it's time for Toronto's genuine environment voters to confront and unseat the green NIMBYs who've wormed their way into leadership within some residents' associations as well as some suburban council seats. I confess I've been following this for a while and had never, until reading that, heard of green NIMBYs. Who are they? Well, uh, first of all, there's nothing actually green or environmentally friendly about green NIMBYs or green NIMBYism. NIMBYism is opposition to change and densification and often adding new housing in your own backyard. Not in my backyard is what it stands for. Exactly. And green NIMBYism is simply the attempt to dress up that opposition, which is based on simple self-interest or subjective aesthetic preferences or sometimes outright environmental racism in some kind of pseudo-environmental uh, post-rationalization. Environmental uh, racism? What does that mean? So environmental racism means the unequal distribution of environmental benefits and burdens based on race, which is a prohibited ground. And uh, the Human Rights Commission has identified not just environmental racism, but other forms of uh, other prohibited grounds uh, as areas where land use planning ends up causing discrimination. So if all the homes that are affordable for people who can't afford a house in a society where we have major disparities in income based on race, if all those have to be concentrated only on main streets or only in a few pockets, and they're kept out of the leafy, quiet locations without a lot of car traffic, then what we really have is the environmental benefits being hoarded by people who aren't racialized and denied to people who are racialized. Okay, green nimbyism, you tell us, therefore, is a problem. And, I mean, the answer might be self-evident, but let's go through it. Why is it a problem in your view? Sure. Uh, green NIMBYism, like, like all NIMBYism, is a massive environmental problem to the extent that governments give into it. From an environmental point of view, it is absolutely vital that we add a lot of new homes and workplaces and shops very quickly to existing low-density so-called single detached neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. That includes mid-rise in on avenues and includes uh, high-rise around major transit stations, but it also includes walk-up apartments, townhomes, compact forms of housing in neighborhoods that are currently restricted to single detached homes. And we but, should say that's probably 70% of the area in the 416. Absolutely, and this yeah. is one of the, you know, a major vector of, of discrimination and inequity is that we have much of the best land reserved for how, types of housing that can only be afforded by you know, the richest strata hmm. of society in the region. Okay, let's go back to first principles here then for a second. Environmental assessments, when they're done properly and for the right reasons, are necessary in the first place because why? Well, environmental assessments are necessary because when we make big changes very quickly, they can cause harm, particularly if it's in areas that are unaffected, that are not heavily impacted now. So if you're building, for example, Highway 413 through the Green Belt and through farmland, there are likely to be very huge effects on endangered species, other species at risk, and on farmland. Those are bona fide environmental considerations. One of the problems that we have is that, you know, we've heard, you know, historically of incidents of the environmental assessment process being used in cynical ways, for example, to obstruct bike lanes in the city of Toronto for years. It was only in 2015 that we decided that we were not going to require environmental assessment for that. And that's what's allowed some of the proliferation of bike lanes since then. Uh, but what we think of as uh, environmental assessment often isn't strictly the environmental assessment process. I should make it clear. Uh, when we're talking about uh, green nimbyism in neighborhoods, uh, those assessments of environmental concerns are actually channeled through rezoning, official plan amendments, and uh, committee of adjustment approvals. And so we have residents associations or just individuals who don't like a particular development 
uh, cloaking their opposition to, say, a set of townhomes or a walk-up apartment building in their neighborhood in spurious claims that you know, a shadow falling on their backyard is some kind of environmental damage or uh, that losing a, a, you know, a privet hedge or, or what? Some, uh, you know, a, a privet, it, it's a, you know, a, an ornamental hedge okay. or, or, or some manicured lawn is an environmental harm. When what we know, there's absolute consensus now among genuine environmentalists mm. that we desperately need to add housing there, both to keep it out of actual habitat, actual farmland, but also because those existing neighborhoods, they have nowhere near the density and the mix of uses that they need they in order to it. wean people off cars. Yeah. And we desperately need to get pretty much every neighborhood that we have now up to 90 or 100 people per hectare in order to, to meet our climate obligations. Okay, let me circle back to something you said a moment ago. You said that environmental assessments were being used in an attempt to prohibit the construction of more bike lanes. Right. What was the argument that you could use to say we need an environmental assessment on whether it's appropriate to put a bike lane on street X, Y, or Z. Well, truth be told, I never did hear a sound justification for it. It was a technical opportunity to delay the process based on a technical reading of the Environmental Assessment Act that, frankly, not everyone dealt with, uh, that not everyone agreed with. And the good news is that that was corrected. There was clarifying language. What we need to see now is that kind of reform brought to the other ways that we uh, assess environmental harm. With respect to land use planning rules, we need zoning that allows uh, denser forms of housing as of right in existing neighborhoods. We've already gotten rid of uh, the minimum parking requirements that were a major source of environmental problems. Uh, and so we basically need to replace the rules that keep the vast majority of residential land in the GTA reserved for the most environmentally damaging, wasteful, car-dependent forms of development, we need to replace them with new rules that aren't designed to preserve stability. They're designed to actively transform those communities by adding as many homes as we can, bringing them up to transit supporting density quickly, adding those corner shores and shops so they become those 15-minute complete communities. Hmm. It's about using law to promote change, the things that we want, rather than simply to preserve the status quo. What you're doing now, I think I'm right about this, but you can tell me. What you're doing now, an environmentalist calling out the, in your judgment, abuse of environmental assessments to prohibit planning goals that you think are appropriate, that's something that's fairly new. I haven't seen this happen much over the years. Am I right in saying this is a fairly new thing? I wouldn't quite say that that's right. So for example, environmentalists were very much in favor of uh, if you recall the, renew the renewable energy legislation mm -hmm. that uh, streamlined environmental assessments and replaced it with a different process to get uh, you know, wind turbines built quickly. Uh, and environmental assessment, uh, environmentalists were always opposed to the use of environmental assessment uh, for things like bike lanes. And okay, environmentalists only... were pushing for densification. What, the problem that we've had is folks who aren't really environmentalists sort of putting on the cloak of environmentalism to sort of uh, immunize them from criticism and often turning that into very successful political careers based on obstructing development in Name those names. suburban neighborhoods. Well, I, I'm a nonpartisan. We are, we're a charity at Environmental Defense. We have to be nonpartisan. So I can't name names by name. But what I can do is say, uh, you know, for example, neighborhoods like Leaside, neighborhoods like uh, Etobicoke Center, uh, Etobic uh, neighborhoods like uh, North Scarborough North, you know, the, for years and years, incumbent councillors in those wards and the current incumbent councillors, they have been obstructing housing and uh, preventing them from getting up to the densities that they need in order to allow the residents in those very neighborhoods to get by comfortably without a car. And meanwhile, on the other hand, I, ha I really have to look at the other side of it. And that is that four wards in the core of the city have uh, accommodated something like 61% of population growth in recent years. And you, wouldn't, you would never know this from following social media, but you know, those wards are the core wards, Toronto Centre, uh, uh, St. Paul's, uh, it's uh, 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 University of Rosedale, mm -hmm. and Trinity Spadina. Those are the, the wards that are embracing growth. Well, there's lots uh, of new condos yeah, in those areas and, and so on. And it's a very interesting phenomenon because essentially you have the political coalition that's been behind uh, the mayor on uh, Toronto City Council that's been, you know, the NIMBY block on council. 
and you know the the main opposition bloc uh, in Toronto uh, that has frankly been very good about accommodating growth. And it's worth noting that those neighborhoods are already starting from a place that's much closer and often already where we need to be. And that's that 100 people and jobs per hectare. We need to keep the focus on neighborhoods that are low density, bringing them up to uh, densities that support frequent, reliable transit and allow people to get out of their cars. And that means neighborhoods uh, you know, like York Southwestern and uh, uh, Mimico and, uh, and, and as I said, you know, Central Scarborough, Scarborough Southwest, those are very important places to add a lot of housing very quickly. Okay, I appreciate that you're a charity and you're not prepared to name names for that reason, but we're having a municipal election in a matter of a couple of weeks. Do you want to give people some advice on what you think they ought to do? You, your absolute litmus test, if you care about the environment, if you are voting, if you are uh, allocating your vote based on, on what's best for the environment, you've got to vote for someone who's committed to getting rid of exclusionary zoning in your neighborhood. And here's the big one. It can't just be about deregulation. You've got to vote for someone who is committed to increasing Toronto's overall target for population growth, if you live in Toronto, from something a little over 700,000, which is currently planned, to 1.4 million new Torontonians by 2051. Here's the problem with this. I appreciate the advice, but you're asking people who live in neighborhoods that they like left the way they are to vote for things that will increase the population and density in their neighborhoods to potentially the way they don't want them. So why would people do that? Well, I would question, first of all, whether that's really true. So environmental defense has of done some true because very the, extensive... Hang on, hang on, yeah. Phil. Of course it's true because the people who get elected in those neighborhoods today uh, are, are preventing increasing density because they know that their constituents don't want more density. Well, that's why 70% of the city, you can't put up more than a one-story bungalow. So we have quite an incumbency advantage in Toronto. For but sure. What we know Everywhere. now is that there's been a sharp change in those attitudes because of the housing crisis because of the starkness of uh, the climate emergency and because of you know, the real attacks on farmland in the suburbs, there is a real consensus, certainly among folks who genuinely care about the environment now, that they want that housing in their neighborhoods. So we did a poll last year in April, uh, that's before a lot of this advocacy happened, which showed that the vast majority of residents in those neighborhoods, those low rise uh, residential neighborhoods in Toronto, are now, uh, they would support adding a lot of new homes in buildings of up to, you know, apartments, walk-up apartments of three stories, uh, even there's more supporters than opponents in those neighborhoods for housing of four to six stories than there are. So there's a shift. Whatever may have been the case before, the prospect that, you know, our kids may not be able to stay in that community. There's just not a place for them. They could be priced out of the community. Mm -hmm. The prospect that we may not be able to downsize in our own neighborhoods, it, it, it's becoming very stark for people and it's, ha it's causing people to change their minds. So I'd advise politicians not to trust, you know, the old reliable uh, view that NIMBYism is always the safe way to go. I think that's changing now. I think that people are concerned about getting homes built in existing neighborhoods and the polling that we've done backs that up. Uh, we got a minute left here for me to ask you. Uh, clearly, you don't seem to be a fan of the current mayor as it relates to... I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I won't say that. I, okay, what I would well, say is that I'd like to see the mayor make a sharp U-turn in the approach that's been taken to policy. Whether it's the same mayor okay, or a different so you're, mayor, you're, that's indifferent to me. In which case, uh, who are you voting for on the 24th? I can't tell you that. <laughs> do you, as you look at the alternative candidates to the current mayor of Toronto, who do you like? Uh, listen... Uh, I, I got to stay away from the names, but I think we know who the main opponent, uh, uh, the main opposition figure of the mayor is, and certainly the policy proposals that the, uh, the opposition has brought to, to bear in this campaign, they line up very much with, uh, with what envi uh, environmental defense's litmus test for Ontario is. And, but we're still hopeful that the mayor will also make that change and embrace our complete uh, environmental Litmus Test for Ontario, which is available on the environmental website, uh, environmental defense website. You can be safe in the knowledge that CRA will not be coming after you as a result of this interview. <laughs> there you go. That's Phil Pothen, Environmental Defense. Phil, thanks for coming into TVO tonight. Thank you very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.